Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, Dr. Geller, if you could provide that information uh, to me as well uh, that, that you were just talking about. Uh, it's, uh, yes, sir. Very interesting. I found uh, the te your testimony and everybody's testimony uh, very informative. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you having these hearings. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, I don't understand mental illness. Uh, it worries me because I don't. And it's one of those areas where I, I least like these hearings that the chairman has called because normally I have a pretty good idea of where I think we ought to go uh, when it comes to these mental health issues. I have to confess that I'm learning every time we have a hearing something, but I'm also uh, concerned that I don't think that uh, we have uh, all the answers or that we even have any idea of what all the answers are. So I appreciate you all helping us try to figure that out as representatives of the, of the people. It is interesting because we're all trying, I think, Democrats and Republicans on this this subcommittee are trying to figure out what we can do to make the situation better. I don't, however, believe that in the short term we're going to be able to make huge differences um, because, because we're going to have to do some trial and error. We're going to have to try to do some new things and some different things, and uh, I appreciate that. In that regard, uh, I guess I'll look to Mr. Darton and to Judge Leifman. How can we make the, the court system better? We're not going to overnight say, okay, none of the folks with mental illnesses are going to come into the court systems. But what can we do to make the court system better? You've heard uh, from uh, Ms. DeGette, who has a public defender background and, and judge, uh, now Congressman Butterfield. I was a criminal defense attorney for 27 years. Uh, and I have to commend one of my judges back home. It hasn't set up a, a mental health court, but has a mental health docket where she deals with uh, folks who have those issues and tries to identify those in advance so that they can have the experts present to, to help on that. But what, what types of things can we do to encourage the states and the federal system to do a, a, a better job until we fix it? What can we do to help out in the court systems? Thank you, Congressman. I'll be quick because Judge Lickman and I have talked before about these things. Um, Getting the courts more engaged is imperative. In our court system, they have been completely disengaged. Whenever you ask them about solutions, they say, well, we have a mental health court, so it's done. Their mental health court usually handles about 150 cases total a year. I usually have about 3,500 mentally ill in my jail on a day. So we can't be diverted when people have programs that are inherently good but aren't getting at the heart of the problem. What we have been doing internally is trying to identify people literally as they are dropped off from being arrested the night before, downloading quickly their information on their mental illness, and then we put a file together for the public defender. I am a former State's attorney. Uh, we put a, a file together for the public defender to plead with the judge that this person is not necessarily a criminal, put them in an alternative setting such as a nursing home setting. And we have been doing that at my jail where I put electronic bracelets on their legs. I monitor them at this setting. The results are fantastic. As you can imagine, compared to what the other treatment would be, which is I put them in a four by eight cell with a complete stranger with their own issues as well. So we have been doing that. And then on the back end, we have been pretty much winging it. And that is why, when Congressman, when you talk about trial and error, that really is the route that we have been going. It's, let's, it can't get any worse than it is now, so let's try some new things. So on the back end, what we have been doing is we ourselves have been putting together case plans to them. We drive them to locations where we potentially can get housing for them so they can be there and be stabilized. And then we run a 24-hour hotline to try to, when they are in crisis, to get out to them to help them. But it is just what you said, Congressman. We are trial and error stage right now, but there are things such as that that certain judicial circuits could be doing. Others are better. Ours is a real struggle. Judge. Thank you for your question. Uh, we have created an organization called the Judges Leadership Initiative with a parallel organization called the Psychiatric Leadership Group. And we are working with the American Psychiatric Foundation. And what we are doing now is we have about 400 judges involved in this operation. And we are going around the country. We have developed a curriculum to teach judges how to identify people in court who may have a serious mental illness, how to de escalate a situation in court so they don't make it worse but more importantly, how to work in the community to set up the kind of supports you need to be able to divert this population. And so what we recommend are a couple things. A pre-arrest type diversion where you work with law enforcement to teach them a program called Crisis Intervention Team Policing, where the police are actually taught how to de-escalate, where to transport, and how to avoid an arrest. Our <coughs> statistics are phenomenal. Um, as I mentioned, we've closed the jail as a result of our CIT officers in Dade County. We have also taught them to set up post-arrest diversion programs so that you take low-level offenses that don't need to be in jail or 
felonies that are nonviolent and you make sure that they get access to treatment. Uh, Sheriff Dart is correct. A mental health court only handles a fraction of the case and bless you. And the data is such that unless they're taking the right people, they actually can do more harm than good. So you have to be very careful and you have to be educated. And, and Mr. Chairman, I know I'm out of time, but could we give uh, Chief, Chief uh, Viscotti, uh, uh, no, I mispronounced that, I apologize. <laughs> but could we give the Chief a moment to comment on that as well? Yes. Well, I would, uh, I would say our, our main concern law enforcement wise are the seriously mentally ill group that are unaware of their illness. I mean, that, that's where it lies where in the problem lies for us. The police departments, your county directors know who these certain group of people are because we deal with them every day. Uh, and there's, there's answers to, that we can deal with that. Uh, in a case that we had not long ago, we had a woman severely mentally ill, went into a house, no one was home, took the pit bull and put it in a closet, went upstairs, took all the clothing out of the woman's clothes, put, him, put her dishes from upstairs, downstairs, moved all the pictures, spent the day. The woman came home, the homeowner, and walked in on her and of course, you know, had a cow right then and there, called the police, the police come, and she was totally out of her mind, uh, psychotic, carrying on. So when I arrived at the police station on a different matter, I heard this screaming coming from our booking area. She was in the booking area, you know, voices were telling her and she was complaining she was being raped by whatever at the time while she's sitting there. So I made a decision at that point, which a lot of people don't do, but being familiar with this topic, I said, Listen, we're not, we're not arresting her for burglary. I said, we need to, what, she's going to go to the, to the psych unit, but I'm going to send a letter with her saying that she is obviously dangerous. She could have been killed. Whoever came home could have shot and killed her, most likely to happen. I said, if we arrest her, she's going to go to the county jail. She's going to be a major problem for them. From there, our, our officers are going to go out to grand jury where they're going to move to indict her for whatever. She'll be in jail for a year before they decide that she's so mentally ill that she can't stand trial and then she'll be back here again. I said, so let's get her into the system now and put her, put her through that service. But I accompanied that with a letter to our county mental health director saying, I strongly suggest that you know, she, she has proven to be dangerous. She has a long history to herself mostly. Um, I suggest that you enter her into the assisted outpatient treat, treatment program. This program then, they provide the services to her through this program. She has not been a problem since. They monitor to make sure that she's in some kind of treatment, and as long as she's in treatment, she's not a problem. However, if we went the legal system as we normally would do, we would be dealing with her every few weeks because she has anosognosia, she does not believe she's ill, and, and, and I know, uh, you know stigmatism is a big concern, and, and I, my wife and I both pray for the day that our daughter has the insight that Mr. Rahim has into her illness, because I believe if she had that insight, she could seek these, the, the, what everybody's talking about, care in the community. It's been 20 years almost, and she has, does not have that insight. She, she has voices, and they are, as she concerned, a supreme being. I hate to she cut you off, but my time is way over. I'm Thank sorry. You. That's all right. <laughs> but you get Thank going. You. I, on I, I, no, I appreciate the testimony. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman.